la gioia di salutare tutta la grande famiglia del Giro d'Italia. For the first time in its history, the greatest event in the Italian sporting calendar starts here in the Vatican City. Welcoming not only the riders, but also the officials, the judges, the medical staff and support teams, the Pope gives his blessing to all those taking part in this great pageant, the Giro d'Italia. Every year in May, since 1909, a strange caravan has wound its way around Italy. The caravan of the Giro d'Italia. What is the Giro? 22 days of cycling, nearly 2,500 miles. Rome, Pompeii, Amalfi, Modena, San Remo, the passes of the Dolomites, the Valley of the Po, and finally Milan. Together with the Tour de France, the Giro is the longest and most demanding cycle race in the world one of the last ultimate endeavors of our time, one of the toughest trials in sport. But for 40 million Italians, it's a national carnival, the biggest show of the year. Third stage, Pompeii to Sorrento. The 140 riders are pedaling up to the start in processional order. Nearly all the aces in international cycling are here. The hot favorite, Belgian Eddie Merckx, the idol of Italian cycling, Felici Gimondi, the little Spanish climbing star, Jose Manuel Fuente. The first two stages, from Rome to Formia, and from Formia to Pompeii, were fairly uneventful, but this third stage should give us the first important results. <laughs> The day's racing got underway at exactly 11.30. This stage is only 105 miles long. It follows the coast to Sorrento, then through Positano to Amalfi. After that, we get the first two big climbs, up Monte Agirola and the 3,500-foot Monte Faito. From Faito, there's a steep drop to the sea and the finish back in Sorrento. <laughs>
Attenzione, attenzione, qui Rai 1. The field arrived here at Amalfi in one big bunch and they're starting the climb up the 2,300 foot Azurola. We're expecting the Spanish mountain climber Fuente to make his first attack here using his tremendous talent at the expense of race favourite Eddie Merckx. Although there are cash prizes for the ascent of Azurola, the biggest mountain prize on this stage is for the decisive climb up Monte Paito. We're now at the foot of Monte Paito. Fuente has succeeded in breaking away and he's opened up a lead of 30 seconds over the first bunch headed by Eddie Merckx. Merckx is now second among the chasers and dropping further back. He's a full minute behind Fuente. Number 91, Fuente, has now increased his lead to 1 minute 10 seconds. And he's being chased by a group including Gimondi and Fuente's fellow countrymen, Lascagna and Uri Bazubia, who are sitting in on the others. A second group, including Eddie Merckx, is 1 minute 30 seconds behind, and it looks to us as though Merckx is far from fit at the moment. Number 11, Felice Gimondi, the world champion, and the first group. Eddie Merckx is now leading that second bunch, but he's still losing ground. Here, with 68 miles gone, Fuente has increased his lead to two minutes. I don't think I'm a good climber just because I come from a mountainous part of Spain. It's more a simple matter of weight. On the way up Monte Faito, I tried to give myself such a big lead that Eddie Merckx couldn't hope to close it on the descent, where he has the weight advantage. And here at the summit of Monte Faito, it's Fuente first and starting on the 15-mile descent to the finish in Sorrento. On this stretch, the riders will reach speeds between 50 and 60 miles per hour. Jose Manuel Fuente coming in to take this third stage with a margin of 33 seconds over the next group. Fuente also takes the pink jersey, the symbol of leadership in the Giro, just as the yellow jersey is in the Tour de France. A rider's time on each stage is added to his total, and the one with the fastest overall time inherits the pink jersey. It was hard going right from the start. On the way up Monte Faito, I wondered if Eddie Merckx might suddenly have had to give up the chase because of his recent illness. 
When he isn't with the leaders, you get a lot of uncertainty among the riders. For many of us, he's a kind of beacon. And if that beacon isn't shining, we've got no point of reference. My chance is against him. We've still got 19 stages to go. E qui, eh, dopo quanto ho riferito sul piano di indicazione... You must never think of the organization of the Giro as a theoretical exercise. It's an intensely practical one. The Giro convoy winds its way through Italy over a period of three weeks and is made up of between 900 and 1,000 people. Apart from the 140 riders, there are the support teams, race officials, and, of course, reporters and television teams. And they need a total of 240 cars and 60 motorbikes. 60 of these cars are for the support teams, mechanics and managers, 47 cars and 16 motorbikes for the officials. 18 cars and 15 motorbikes for radio and television, 17 cars and 5 motorbikes for film crews, 64 cars for journalists, 10 for technicians and guests. And the Polizia Stradale, the highway patrol, use 10 cars and 22 motorbikes, so that makes 300 vehicles altogether. All these vehicles are connected by two-way radio, so everybody has up-to-the-minute information on the progress of the race. Special units keep us informed about any problems on the route ahead or around the finish lines. And finally, we have loudspeaker vans to keep the roads clear of the crowds. All this gives us a comprehensive communications network, even in the remotest areas of the countryside and in the tiniest villages. 150 journalists writing for 350 newspapers follow the Giro and send evening reports to the whole world from press rooms specially set up at the end of each stage. Coming up to the end, the last few hundred metres now, this 130 miles, fourth stage from Sorrento to Sapri, and the big bunch tightly packed again. De Vlamic has got to the front, he looks as though Bitos is getting chopped out there on the inside, and, and it's going to be De Vlamic, De Vlamic gets it at the line. Er ist der Roger de Fleming, Belgien, in 5 Stunden, 58, 36 Stunden mit 34,1. Roter Vincino, Italien, Rita Cavazzi, Italien, 4. Johann Ruck, Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Roccato, 5. Serco, der Premier der Belge, Roger de Fleming, 5 Uhr, 50 Minuten 36, der Moyen de 34, 166. Deuxième Italien, Bruno Vicino, qui a été champion de la Nature l'année passée à Sorrento. Troisième Galazzi, Italien, Francesco, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, Organizing the Giro is a bit like organizing a military mobilization. Streets have to be cordoned off, train timetables coordinated, and 12 million spectators along the route kept under control. We have to negotiate with the mayors of all the towns we pass through, with police departments, and even up to ministerial level. Then there's the race itself. The financial side, the teams, the judges, the advertising, all the immediate problems that come up day by day on each stage. I don't think you can learn to cope with these. To organize a race like this, you have to be born to it.
primo corridore della Pilotex. Ecco che vediamo giungere il corridore abruzzese Giuliani della squadra Pilotex. Maglia verde, titolare del Gran Premio della Montagna Plasti Screen. E Quinte, tuttavia la maglia oggi la porterà Univenzo Via che è secondo nella classifica speciale. Un applauso formidabile a Quinte. Quinte, capitano della CAS, maglia rosa penaltissima. Ecco Pella. Ecco Cavalcanti. Felice Cimondi. away on their fifth of the 22 stages of the race, 135 miles today from Sapri to Taranto. The rules of the Giro provide for a feeding station about 60 miles into each stage. The support teams can give their riders food only at these specified points. This usually consists of a packet of sandwiches, fruit, cold tea and mineral water. And the Giro has its traditions. Among them, the riders' habit of going into any inn or restaurant along the route and taking anything they want in the way of soft drinks. The owners of these places usually feel quite flattered. It's mostly the younger members of a team who keep their captain and star riders supplied with drinks, which is why they were originally called water boys, though the name now means much more than this. The water boys have become teammates who support their captain in all tactical areas of the race and see to it that he doesn't waste his energy unnecessarily. They train just as hard as he does, make the same effort, and share the same risks. Each stage carries prizes for places as far down as 20th, which the winners usually divide with their teammates. A first prize might be no more than a few hundred pounds, but victory is worth many times that in terms of appearance money, and much more important, in advertising contracts. So, while a water boy might be paid 5,000 a year by his stable, the real money, for someone like Merckx, is between three to four hundred thousand a year. We're on the sixth stage from Taranto to Foggia, 130 miles, very flat. No downhill stages to give the riders a breather. It's very hot. 
and there's hardly any wind. And the winner of this stage is going to be Bitossi. Franco Bitossi of Italy delights the crowd, winning his first stage of the Giro, taking this sixth stage easily enough from the pack. 20 of the cast team still there in the middle in the pink jersey of overall leader and followed overall by Francesco Mozo of Philotex, Felice Gimondi of Bianchi, and at the moment Eddie Merckx is lying in 11th place. first year as a pro, you have your hopes and dreams. But after a couple of races, you realise you're not made to be a champion. You're cut out to be a water boy. You have to be good to be a water boy. You have to be there when your captain's in trouble, when you need shielding from the wind, for example, so that you'll have enough in reserve for the finish. You have to draw him out of the bunch into the lead and support him on the mountains and in the sprints. <laughs> I'm happy.
happy to be a water boy and friend to Jumundi. He knows I'm very important to him in certain situations, particularly to pull back riders who have suddenly charged off and to stop rival teams taking control. He knows he can rely on me when it counts. I've also been water boy to Merckx, among others, but nobody can handle that for more than two or three years. Merckx is always at the head of the field, so his water boys have to be there too. He simply wears his teammates out. Just watch them in this Giro. For all practical purposes, Merckx doesn't have water boys anymore. He's burnt them all out. With Jumundi, it's quite different. He demands every last ounce of effort too, but he never demands the impossible. The seventh stage from Foggia to Chiete brought nothing significant. Although Fuente came in only 13th, he still kept an overall lead of 28 seconds over Gimondi and 35 seconds over Merckx. Neither will the eighth stage from Chiete to Macerata produce any important changes. The crowd's now in a fever pitch of excitement here, waiting for everything to come in. To the finish, the last vehicles coming in over the line. A few of the official cars still to come in. We're waiting to see that big pack come round the corner. We know that they're all tightly bunched, so the big sprinters are tightening up the toast traps once again, waiting for it. The last outriders coming in. We're waiting to see them come in around that final corner. And who's going to win this stage? It's going to be one of the big sprinters again, we think. And that's the timekeeper's car. My goodness, he's late. He's only just got in over the pack. Zilioli within the lead, and he's not Zilioli. He's lost it, and Bitossi's got his second stage. Bitossi wins. aren't easy. I find the long separations from my family, often seven or eight months of the year, the hardest thing. It's not funny to get a phone call telling me the children are sick and there's nothing I can do about it. Altogether, I spend about 300 days in the saddle, an average 65 miles per day. I've ridden in the Giro nine times and won it twice, in 66 and 69. <laughs> The ninth stage today could see one of the decisive moments of the Giro. Twelve miles before the finish lies the dangerously steep climb up the 4,550-foot Monte Carpeño.
Oh, and the touch of wheels there at the back brings two or three riders down. That's not unusual for this sort of thing to happen, but they're all right, and they'll all be back in the race in a matter of minutes. The riders are allowed to hold on to their team cars in an emergency, as long as the judges can see they're not overdoing it. And still the riders are receiving treatment as a result of that crash and Fasani here is complaining about not having the right gears and a lot of the big boys are a bit upset because the gradients are steeper than was originally said on the stage and they're getting a bit edgy about it and that edginess has resulted in another crash. We've had about 20 riders come off now and there are wheels and bikes all over the place and everybody's scrambling for fresh wheels as a result of punctures and new machines as well. Leaders reach Carpeña at a fast pace and tightly bunched. They now face the five mile climb to the top of Monte Carpeña and then the steep drop to the finish. 112 miles gone of this ninth stage and Fuente, as expected, has made a break and taken a clear lead. Second on the climb is number one, Eddie Merckx, in hot pursuit of Fuente, but losing ground and is already half a minute behind. Number 91 again, Fuente first at the summit, and he takes his second mountain prize. Second, but more than a minute behind him, is number one himself, Eddie Merckx. The five-mile descent from Monte Carpeña. Merckx has the advantage on this stretch because of his greater weight and his skill on curves. Can Fuente keep his overall lead? And conditions are terrible now. It's raining hard, it's misty, the road is slippery, but Fuente is still going all out on the descent.
despite these atrocious weather conditions, there's a vast crowd here greeting Fuente as he comes in to take this stage from Macerata to Carpeña. Jose Manuel Fuente crosses the line, increases his lead slightly overall, I should think. We're waiting to see who's second. It was Merckx at the summit of the mountain, and Merckx seems to have come down like a lion. There he is, pedalling every revolution, counting as he comes in, but he's one minute, four seconds down on Fuente at the line. Fuente has now stretched his overall lead to 1 minute 40 seconds, but there are still 13 difficult stages ahead. stage, Forte de Mami. This stage is basically different to all the others. The 116 riders still in the race will cover a 25-mile circuit from Forte de Mami to Via Reggio and Marino di Massa, and then back to Forte. They don't compete against each other, but against the clock. They start one at a time at 90-second intervals, and the time they take for the 25 miles is added, like all other times, to their overall totals. The time trial. To many experts, the moment of truth has long been the domain of Merckx and Gimondi and the weakness of Fuentes. Gimondi gets ready for the final countdown. The riders have gone off in the reverse order of the general classification, so we're down to the last three. Gimondi, being third overall, gets underway for his 25 miles of torture against the watch. ready for the start. The final countdown for this man, who is reckoned to be perhaps the one who would take the overall lead after this time trial. himself, the last man off, Jose Manuel Fuente, this little dapper Spaniard, hoping that he can hold on to that pink jersey just a little while longer. miles at the turning point in Marina di Massa, the issue is already decided. Gimondi is not going to repeat the time trial victory he scored in 1973. is 38 seconds ahead of Gimondi. Fuente hasn't got here yet, but we understand he's already dropped 50 seconds to Merckx, but that still leaves him with the overall lead. La gallina cocodè, spaventata in mezzo all'aia, fra le vigne e i cavolfiori mi sfuggiva Gaia. Penso a lei e guardo te, che già tremi perché sai, che fra i boschi o in mezzo ai fiori presto mi assai. Arrossisci finché vuoi, corri fuggi se vuoi. Non servi là. Ma... Ah, 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 ah,
wins the time trial by 27 seconds and gains over a minute on Gimondi. He has covered the course in 49 minutes 31 seconds, which means he has averaged 30 miles an hour over a distance of 25 miles. Fuente has done well. He has lost only one minute 12 seconds to Merckx and retains his overall lead. But his advantage over the Belgian is down to 18 seconds. For the mayor of Forte de Marmi, the Giro d'Italia is a great tourist attraction. The Giro is a free entertainment for 12 million Italians, and at least one million of them line the 25-mile route around Forte de Marmi. The town council put up 20,000 pounds to stage the time trial, and they consider it money well spent in terms of publicity for their region. The race costs around one and a half million pounds. Some of the money comes from the magazine Gazzetta dello Sport and some from private sponsors like salami manufacturers and hardware stores who put up their signs and banners along the route. It went much better than I hoped. After all, the time trial isn't my speciality, but I did produce as good a time as I can manage. And the main thing is that Merckx wasn't able to snatch the pink jersey away from me. I think it's going to be much more difficult for me to win the Giro this year than ever before. Fuente has become much stronger, and the course has too many climbs and mountain stages. They don't suit me. In fact, this Giro is a circuit for the mountain specialists. I've got 43 pounds more than Fuente to haul up the climbs, and that gives him a big advantage. Still, the finish is in Milan, and before then I'll do what I can to catch him. I just don't know whether I can or not. It'll be tough, but I'm going to try. Fourteenth stage from Pietra Ligure to San Remo. It's still one big bunch with Merckx and Fuente at the front together and keeping a watchful eye on each other. The torrential rain has made it bitterly cold now. Merckx has attacked and leads the field. Fuente is back in third place. And we don't know why, but Fuente's in a little bit of trouble there. He's got problems now because he's going further and further back and trailing by 2 minutes 30 seconds at the moment. gone and Fuente is even further behind. The leaders are Mertz, Gimondi, Vitossi, Balancelli and now they've got four minutes 30 seconds clear of the little Spaniard.
At the finish in San Remo, a complete sensation. At a single stroke, Merckx takes a huge overall lead. He finishes seven minutes, 43 seconds ahead of Fuente. And Fuente has to yield the pink jersey. Simplemente que ayer me encontraba con una confianza en mí como jamás había visto. As a matter of fact, I was confident I was going to win this stage. I even asked my teammates to force a really fast pace. When we got to the feeding station, I didn't want anything. wasn't the least bit hungry. Suddenly, the Multani and Bianchi teams attacked, and I had nothing in reserve. I'd simply eaten too little. It took my last ounce of strength to get to the top. After that, thank God, it was downhill, and I coasted to the finish. It was a disastrous mistake. These are the terrifying Trecime di Lavaredo. The Dolomites, well, I suppose all mountains, are among the most beautiful things in nature. But for us cycling pros, they are the ultimate test. We're afraid of them, really scared. We start getting nervous days before the tougher mountain stages. And this morning at breakfast, each one of us is trying to hide his apprehension. We can already feel the cruel punishment ahead of us. We're all asking, am I going to be able to stay with the leaders, get to the top among the first? The question haunts all of us. You shouldn't over-dramatize sport, but here in the mountains, words like torture and pain are not out of place. This is where you reach the limits of endurance. The riders are coming up now to the start, and everyone in the pack and in the crowd knows that today is a very special day. The 20th stage, the climax of the Giro. Three difficult mountains in one stretch. Monte Rest, 3,420 feet. Paso Mauria, 4,209 feet. And finally, the supreme test, 7,800 feet up the Trecime Road. The winner here carries off the most coveted mountain prize, the Cima Coppi, named after the great racer Fausto Coppi, and worth 4,000 pounds. We're between the Paso Mauria and the start of the final climb, and Fuentes making a break. Here, on this endless, inhuman ascent, up the Tre Cime, lies his last hope of rectifying his mistake at San Remo, of making up the time he lost there, of snatching victory in the Giro. This is the Spaniard's last chance. On Monte Generoso, he recovered over two minutes. On the Colle di San Fermo, it was only 30 seconds. In Sella Val Sugana, he gained not one yard. Nevertheless, he has made good more than two minutes. His deficit is now five minutes, nine seconds. Can he succeed in one great burst in making up this time, in closing the gap? Twenty has shaken off the chasers and is approaching the last big climb. mountain stages, particularly when I'm giving everything I've got, I'm very afraid of cramp. I always think of Monte Carpegna a couple of years ago. Even though I had a lead of nine minutes over Eddie Merckx, I decided to attack. I lost the lot. 
The reporters really went to town about me. The truth was that I'd got cramp. Cramp is an invisible wound. You can't imagine what it's like unless you've got it. The pain is dreadful. It's so dreadful you just don't want to go on. But you have to go on. One night when I was dropping off to sleep, I started thinking how lovely it would be if some reporter suddenly got cramp in his fingers in the middle of writing his article about me. But he couldn't just stop. He had to go on, tapping away at his typewriter with his agonizing cramped fingers, just as we have to ride on. If they went through that, I think some critics might write differently about us when we're in trouble on the mountains. Puente is still out on his own at Lake Misurina and is beginning this critical climb up the Trecime de Lavaredo. The first bunch, led by the schoonmarker, the faithful lieutenant of Eddie Merckx, with Merckx just behind, are 40 seconds back. Spaniard is increasing his lead now as he starts up the big climb with five miles to go and all uphill. Chasing Fuente is now 45 seconds behind. Merckx is in the lead of it, then number 11, Gimondi, and number 132, Baron Kelly. 20 seconds further back, it's Tino Conti of the Zonka team, and he's followed up by Francesco Moser of Philotex, this young Italian hope who they reckon will take over from Gimondi himself. mountain specialist is very hard. Not that I'd rather be anything else, because I don't think you can become, well, let's say a better human being without effort. You can beat the problems of life much more easily if you've met hardship. It sometimes looks as if the first rider to the top has done it fairly easily. You tend to feel more sorry for the men who've knocked themselves out to make the climb at all. But believe me, to be quicker than the rest, and in particular to be quicker than the other stars, involves a lot of pain. A cyclist uses 6,000 calories during a mountain stage. He prepares for this grind by doing three to 3,500 miles in training and a series of warm-up races. On some days he will experience altitude changes of 6,500 feet and temperature differences of 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. The gradient is sometimes steeper than one in five. Of all athletes, cycling pros have the largest hearts and in normal circumstances a very low pulse rate. 
but on mountain climbs, this may rise as high as 180 to 200, which could lead to heart failure in a non-athlete. Although none of the competitors carries any excess weight, they lose an average 12 to 16 pounds during the Giro. gone and Fuente is still piling on the pressure and leads his rivals now by over a minute. The gradient is one in six. The temperature is minus two centigrade. Three and a half miles to go. Something of a surprise now as young Baron Kelly of the Skik team has moved into second place. He's shaken off Merckx and is chasing Fuente alone. Merckx is 12 seconds behind him and closely marked by Fuente's teammate Lopez Carrillo and behind him the Italian Bataglin. seconds further back in his world champions rainbow jersey is Felici Gimondi. Fuente's gone further into the lead. He's still pounding away at the pedals, one minute, ten seconds ahead of Baron Kelly and one and a half minutes ahead of Merckx. The riders have been on the road for five and a half hours and still have two miles to go. comes Fuente into the last half mile now and still holding second place behind him is young Baron Kelly. 
and he's leading Conti, who's got up to Merckx and Lopez Carrillo. Lopez Carrillo still marking Eddie Merckx, and Bataglin has been dropped. Merckx is fighting back with all his strength, and is only one minute, 40 seconds behind Fuente. swings into the last bend with just over 200 metres to go. Fuente crosses the line first, but he hasn't made it. He's not won overall. He hasn't succeeded in making up that deficit of five minutes and four seconds on this, his last chance. Eddie Merckx comes into the last 200 metres, one minute, 47 seconds behind Fuente. Young Baron Kelly comes in to take a surprise second place, well ahead of Tino Conti, who's ridden superbly up the mountain, to come in to take third place, absolutely exhausted. Tremendous piece of riding by Conti, and then Merckx himself coming in to take fourth position, and that means Merckx has held on to the lead. Just behind him, Lopez Carrillo and Gimondi coming up together. Fuente hasn't made good his mistake of San Remo. He has won this, the toughest stage of the Giro, but nevertheless, the overall victory is lost.
the Giro swings into the stadium in Milan, off the road and for the last time, 22 stages gone, and who's going to win this final one as they come swarming in? They're all together in a big seeming mass as they come around the corner, they have a lap and a half of the track to do, they've already crossed the line, down the back straight, who's it going to be to win this last stage? Marino Basso of Italy is the man who's tipped to win and he's coming up on the outside as they come round this banking. Basso, oh and he's hooked up the track, tremendous hook there as Basso tried to get round the outside and he didn't make it, but is he going to make it at the line this time? Yes, Basso of Italy wins the stage. A winner of the 22nd stage from Bassano di Grappa to Milan, Marino Basso. The 57th Giro is over. <laughs> Fuente has won four stages and is undisputed king of the mountains. He'd had every chance to win the Giro outright, but his error at the 14th stage cost him victory. The race was 2,455 miles long. 14 teams and 140 riders did battle for 22 days. At the end of it all, in third place, Felice Gimondi, only 33 seconds behind the winner. Second, Gian Battista Baroncelli, only 12 seconds behind. And this is the narrowest margin in the history of the Giro. But the winner of the 57th Giro d'Italia in 113 hours, 8 minutes and 13 seconds, Eddie Merckx. Merckx has won the Giro five times, the Tour de France five times, and three world championships. He has scored 385 victories, a record that makes him the greatest roadman in the history of cycling. <laughs>